Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us here tonight with uh, Simply Hollywood's section meeting. I'm Brian Gaffney. Normally we would open this meeting with Linda Rosner, our chair uh, for this event, but uh, she's not gonna be able to join us today. So I'm our past chair and I'm excited to join us and, and launch this meeting off tonight. But before we get into the event, I just wanted to bring up, in addition to Simply Hollywood, we are part of the many chapters that make up the greater Simpty organization. If you go to simpty.org, you can find out all sorts of information about becoming a member, being it from a student uh, for free, all the way up to corporate organizational memberships. There's all sorts of educational information, videos, programs, and access to other information besides what we're gonna talk about tonight. But tonight I'm excited to um, introduce Deborah Kaufman Deborah is going to be our host and moderator for tonight. She is the staff writer for USC's ETC Centric or TC newsletter. I read it every day. It's uh, my go-to newsletter. But Deborah's written from everything about entertainment technology, from the New York Times to Wired magazine. Uh, she's just brilliant with all the information she knows, and she's just a great uh, opportunity here to have her as our moderator tonight. So. Welcome, Deborah, and uh, welcome to the group here. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, well, now I have to live up to all, to all that praise, but this is a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. Before we get into it, let me, one little housekeeping item, which is we are gonna want to answer your questions. Please ask the questions in the Q&A rather than the chat, because we'll, we'll go to the Q&A first to look for, for questions. Um, I am a writer at uh, Entertainment Technology Center at USC. ETC, if you don't know, is a think tank and a research center. And one of the things that we do at ETC is we do movies that are proof of concept for new technologies, from cloud entertainment to you name it. Uh, Ripple Effect was done to test uh, safety viz uh, in, in the wake of the coronavirus as well as virtual production and remote production. So we have three guests today that were uh, headed the production of this film and will be able to answer all your questions and present a lot of information. Uh, first, we have Eric Weaver, one of the executive producers of Ripple Effect, who is a specialist focused on the intersection of cloud and the m and industry, and is currently running virtual and adaptive production projects for the Entertainment Technology Center. Catherine Burlhart is a cinematographer, director, and producer who leverages volumetric capture, visualization techniques, and supervising visual effects to enhance projects. She has been working to redefine best practices and standards in virtual production for the past decade. Greg Chaccio was another executive producer of Ripple Effect. He is a creative technologist and has served in executive operational roles at Technicolor, Deluxe, SIM and Ascent Media, and is currently working to advance virtual and remote production pipelines. So we're gonna to start today's program with Eric, who is going to tell us a little bit about Safety Viz. Take it away, Eric. Hello, Deborah, thank you so much. Um, I actually wanna kind of open with why. Um, why should we care? Let's see if I go to full screen on this. Is that full screen? why should we care basically about virtual production? Well, in this year, 2021, it looks like over 200 stages will come up uh, representing an average of about $4 million per stage in cost with an economic impact of $800 million to um, production. Um, this represents a major paradigm shift in potentially the way things are made. Um, there's been a couple major innovations that have all kind of come together and really opened this opportunity up in between things like Unreal um, and the content that can be created, which allows uh, a look and feel that's absolutely real that can be created a computer that's three-dimensional. Um, 
to things like NVIDIA and the GPU advances. Those combined, combined with basically um, the COVID era where you need to control a lot more, you can't ship huge crews out and other things. So this is really a major shift. So this is really gonna impact things rather heavily. And once we really learn how to do this good, it's gonna be a major aspect. So let me talk just really quickly about ripple effect. Um, again, like Deborah said, this is the fourth film in the series of short films. So what we do is we basically give a grant to um, an individual of diversity to write and direct this, a student usually from USC. And then we pull together all the partners. So we, um, for example, on this one, Hannah, uh, Margo and Sabina were the ones giving the opportunity to create content. And it's really great because the studios don't necessarily care so much about the content so they can make a story about anything they wanna do. Um, and I won't reveal this particular story at this point. Um, uh, hopefully it will go out to a place where you can watch it. But they have some really touching points on where we are in community and life right now and just following propaganda blindly. So it's, it's a pretty interesting story there. Um, so what did it take to do this or, or what did we bring together here? Uh, we brought four primary funding organizations, 29 supporting organizations, 117 members on Slack, uh, over a 12 week period from pre-production through production that doesn't include post, which uh, Greg got to oversee. Uh, we produced 26,000 um, Slack messages um, and 112 hour long recorded meetings to produce nine minutes of content. Um, this is quite the learning curve. This isn't something that you just uh, assume is how things have always been. There is quite a bit of shift in the mentality to be able to execute this uh, well. So one of the key features here uh, that one of the studios came to us with is COVID safety. And so I'm gonna talk through some of this part. So what are the goals of COVID safety? And in our meetings, we had a really great comment from one of the senior uh, producers at a studio. And he said, you know, if I have anybody extra on set that gets sick, uh, that didn't need to be there, um, my, I, my head's chopped, I'm done, I'm over with. You, you, you don't wanna put people in risk nowadays that don't need to be at risk. So that's a lot of what we were looking at is how do you begin to break this down and understand how to do some of these things? So you can see a couple pictures from set, uh, the different locations we were working on. Um, so when we approached this problem, uh, we started with phase one and that's data translatability. So what we took was every single major state, um, city, uh, government and union, and we broke down their COVID rules. Like we took a spreadsheet and roughly 319 uh, COVID control practices, this is changing number all the time. Um, and we said, who are following what constrictions and why are they following these ones? So we understood exactly what that was. We also really pioneered this, um, if you've been on set recently, um, you, this kind of uh, quiz that you get every day. Here's what I need to go through protocol wise. Um, from there, what we did is we came in and we took a virtual production standpoint, uh, kind of a combination of tech viz and scanned kind of the lots there. So we brought in virtual wonders, which had done some really amazing work out there in scanning major historical landmarks. And we did a full scan and we're gonna talk a little bit more about this um, and how we built these things out and what we did in a video that we've got to share. So that was a, a fascinating part. And then the third part of what we did was kind of data audibility. So individuals on set were carrying something called set buddies. And so these are devices that look a lot like phones that were originally pioneered to remove phones from people's hands in very highly sensitive areas. So if you're working on the latest marble or something and you don't want somebody to come to set that might take screenshots or do other things, that's what it was originally used for. But in this situation, what we did is we repurposed it and we repurposed it to, um, to basically track proximity of people, who is near whom, and if somebody ended up getting sick, then um, now we can track or see who they were near. And the way this also works, if you've been on set recently, is you tend to work in teams or groups. 
um, you know, everyone working on the camera or other places. So you can be near some people, but this device would also give you a haptic feedback if you were too close to anybody uh, that was not within your allowed group, um, which we actually found a little interesting and tricky at times uh, because when you're wearing all that gear, it's hard not to just lean in to talk to somebody. And I, Greg will tell you a little bit more later on stories of, of experiences we had with that and experiences that we eventually had with COVID. So, you know, um, to follow up, we've got a couple of lessons learned here and it, all of this stuff in case you need it is also documented in the white paper that's on the ETC website. So you can go and take and look at all of this data that you're be given today and, and understand it a little bit closer and more thoroughly. But, you know, obviously the safety protocols vary between all these obviously, and making sure your information is as up to date is really critical. Um, safety Viz can help plan out and uh, deploy movement. So we found that when we built some of those locations and those spots, it didn't simply work uh, for traffic flow and how these groups would work together. And then finally, contract tracing can help create a new level of auditability and identify exposure if anybody ends up showing up positive to a test. So these are just some of the lessons learned and we can actually also provide several other much more in depth talks on this particular topic. If you wanted to look at it, uh, I'm free to share my slides if you want. At this point, if you wanna just go ahead and roll the video for the work that we did on Safety Viz with Digital Film Tree, that would be wonderful. media and entertainment market is a two trillion dollar industry that employs millions across the globe. Coronavirus officially hitting the U.S. Yet when the catastrophic COVID pandemic of 2020 struck and the months wore on, it became a business locked in near standstill. With no means by which to move forward safely, productions halted, theaters shuttered, jobs were furloughed, a century old industry was brought to the brink of darkness. And then, film production in Los Angeles is gradually making a return since it came to a halt back in March. As COVID restrictions are being lifted, the entertainment industry is getting back to work. But the movie business is uniquely unsuited to social distancing. And the pandemic tightening restrictions. There are plenty of new guidelines to be followed. And from that darkness has come a new year and a new era for Hollywood. One of both increased restrictions and increased innovations. Every production now has to reckon with safety policies, safety protocols. As of late, we've been heavily involved in virtual production. Bridging the gap between virtual productions and traditional physical production and posts is why I started Cineco, Digital Film Tree's virtual production branch. With this emerging technology, physical film sets are virtualized in a game engine into 2D, 3D, or photoreal environments. On Ted Lasso, we were going to shoot on a professional football stadium, and there was no way in the world we were going to be able to get on there and have the time to plan this out in person. So by being able to engage with pre we we built a CG stadium, and it gave us a huge cheat sheet when we were there on the day. And what was once envisioned as a method to pre-visualize certain shots before filming can now be used to pre-visualize a film's entire behind-the-scenes production. What's happened in the COVID era is the same environment that we build for creatives are now also helpful in people planning the safety on set. To take pre and apply it to safety during COVID really was sort of such a nice logical segue. Previs was evolving into something else entirely, a tool that could visually render beyond the lens to help crews adhere to strict COVID safety protocols. And to R&D this, all we needed was a test case. On this particular production called Ripple Effect, we've begun to unpack a whole bunch of different interesting technologies to create the safest on-set experience. We need to both be efficient and 
practical in our workflows, but also maintain a strong health and safety aspect. Between key states, international countries, the unions, there's about 309 control practices. So what we've done in the beginning was collected all of those control practices and created a spreadsheet. Once you get into all of this data, it's really kind of hard to visualize or understand how. So we partnered up with Digital Thumb Tree and we took it to a whole other level. Because we're in virtual production, a lot of what we can do is pre-visualize or final visualize how that would all work. We decided to create a LiDAR scanning of the entire stage. So the LiDAR basically gets all of the accurate measurements of the walls. But when you apply the texture, that's an accurate environment. If the idea of LiDAR on an iPhone catches on, that means anyone can have a accurate environment that they could creatively iterate in. It's really remarkable because that used to be a very enterprisey scanning process, but now it's going to become democratized. And that's just insanely exciting. By taking that scan, we can actually tell how big a space is and how many people can fit in it. So in order to actually visually represent that, we decided to develop these ring lights. Anytime the characters are too close, the ring light turns red. We've had the benefit of working with COVID safety officers to, to prototype this safety visualization because it's a really useful tool for them. Is there a way that we could change like, the time that the people are hand washing? This person is washing their hands for about like one second. <laughs> you want to extend that for? So ideally it would be 20 seconds. We could definitely do that. And I can show you exactly how that will be done having an accurate length of time might also be a useful piece of information. We can then start seeing like, okay, where each department is gonna be, whether it's our department, the camera department, now we get to see like, hey, the space is gonna get a little crowded, so we know we need to start spacing people out. Just by engaging this like planning process, you're addressing safety because you have a high level of clarity on what the lay of the land is. So now we can create basically a narrative or a story. It says, as somebody walks into the set, where are the areas they're allowed to go? Where are they not allowed to go? And we can run through those narratives. You get to really see it in a visual manner. So it's not just simply looking at this massive spreadsheet and kind of somewhat being overwhelmed. We then showed our work to some of the largest film studios and streaming platforms in Hollywood. This will change depending on where it's reporting that distance. So we're able to do that quickly. And I think this also is a tool that will help for location scouting um, while in engine as opposed to having to visit the set. We got amazing feedback from all, which led to phase two of our safety viz effort. We leveraged Cinecode's mini-map feature so any crew member can look at a PDF or go to an image or video online and know exactly what the lay of the land is. We were able to render simple safety training images that can be shared with cast and crew by posting them to the call sheet. It's such a galvanizing tool because as soon as you have that vision, now you can share it with everyone just by pushing play and everyone knows what's up. With safety is a proven success on the set of Ripple Effect, the implications for it in both physical and virtual production become nearly limitless in the hands of filmmakers. The idea of even having safety biz is something that I don't think we would have even envisioned a couple years ago. But in the current culture where safety has become such a priority, it's given productions an excellent tool where they can actually visualize the spacing of people, visualize what the sets and the stages look like, and actually allow them to safely prepare for production before they're there on the day. One of the most interesting things about what COVID has done to our industry is that the changes that it's creating in the filmmaking process, I think are gonna stick around. We're gonna have a lot more tools and be able to anticipate things that we weren't anticipating before. When you can pre-visualize sequences or pre-visualize the safety of things because to do stunts or trickier things, it becomes a great tool to have in your tool belt. Even before COVID, I had this term that I use, which is co-opetition. We can be competitors 
but it also makes sense to collaborate on certain things. This is a whole new level of collaboration. It's more of a community effort because you cannot underestimate the challenges that everyone has gone through. So it feels good to be part of an industry like this and the momentum of storytelling, even at the most challenging times, that that inspires me. Thank you so much, uh, Eric. We don't seem to have any questions at the moment. Uh, so remember housekeeping rule again, please put your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, next up, Catherine, um, what can you tell us about uh, virtual production on Ripple Effect? Awesome, let me, I will share my screen really quick. Let's see. All right, just give me a thumbs up or let me know if you can see my screen. I can, yes. Catherine. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, awesome. So I'm Catherine Bilhart, one of the executive producers and the director of virtual production on Short Film Ripple Effect. And I'll be presenting an in-depth look of the virtual production workflows we developed for the project and demonstrate how these workflows are impacting the future evolution of the entertainment industry. So out of the four main LED wall workflows you see here, we used approaches from three, real-time visualization tools, performance capture, and our main focus to explore the execution of final pixel in-camera visual effects for display on smart stage LED walls captured in real time all on camera. So our script was about 12 pages and had three main locations. We designed and executed virtual background workflows for each, the interior dining room scene and exterior battlefield and a vehicle sequence. Each environment uh, had its own unique key findings, creative takeaways and logistical considerations. So starting with our truck sequence, trans lights, green screen and plate photography are commonly used in vehicle scenes as alternatives to shooting on location. Depending on the creative needs and complexity of a vehicle shoot, it can be time consuming to capture multiple locations in one day, or a crew may have limited time to shoot during magic hour. So in ripple effect, we were able to execute and capture footage of our truck that spanned four locations and four different times of day, all in one shoot day. Instead of using green screens and composited plate photography and post, our team built full CG environments in advance of the shoot and rendered them in real time on set during production. Uh, rendering the content in real time actually made it possible to tweak the lighting, adjust the rotation of the virtual world, and a little bit, and even more actually during the shoot. Um, and this also meant that an extended amount of time and resources were necessary prior to pre-production in order to break down our script for in-camera visual effects and to lay out our pipeline. It was critical that we hired key department heads early in pre-production to participate in the script breakdown and shot design process. Their input determined the complexity of each shot we planned for. So how was setting up an LED wall virtual production workflow different than setting up a traditional production? Well, in general, Production should plan to reallocate a portion of their post visual effects resources to the pre production timeline to account for asset creation made by a virtual art department team. It's important to note that visual effects artists and bad artists are not the same. They work in different software packages, pipelines, and approach problem solving differently as they generally have uh, also different final outputs. So, this front loaded budget will also include setting up your pipeline infrastructure, your RD and custom integrated tool design for use on set. For example, providing user-friendly tools for the DPR director on set, such as iPad control for lighting maybe. But specifically on ripple effect, our goal is to walk away from our shoot with final shots, no additional post visual effects needed. From a budgetary perspective, that meant we reallocated at least two thirds of our post visual effects resources to the pre-production stage. We did make sure to include budget for post visual effects for minor fix it shots. Uh, for example, painting out wall scenes and adding full VFX shots, actually like CG shots that were not possible to capture on set. And then we adjusted our pre-production timeline to be much longer than usual to account for early in-camera visual effects workflows, stage testing and pipeline construction. And when integrating real-time game engines during pre-production and shooting on stage, 
We're also accounting for bringing in computer language, networking, development, and tech challenges to set. So having a solid internet connection is an absolute standard for both remote workflows and your smart stage operations team. And Greg's gonna go deep on that one. Um, we were able to save money in post because we committed to this process early on. Um, and so another significant difference when setting up a virtual production workflow is adding the virtual production supervisor and their team to the ecosystem. Uh, this lead acts as both glue and moderator between physical production and visual effects. And in the most distilled sense, they're really helping to ensure a balanced approach between what can be accomplished on set and what can be executed in uh, post. So for our truck and dining room sequences, ICVR and Stargate Studios were our main vendors. ICVR provided storyboards, previs, tech viz, VAD, and on-set content playback, while Stargate Studios contributed consultation as well as on-set camera tracking and LED wall playback. One of the key elements to successful visual effects shot is the design. So at the same time, a DP is forming shots with the director, VP soup, and visual effects supervisor. The production designer is planning the world of the film. So it's critical that these designs are discussed in relation to the shot list in order to economize what areas of the world are actually constructed in the most detail. Centralized databases like F-Track, Shotgun Studios, Kind, and NVIDIA's Omniverse can help keep a creative team organized from the development stages all the way through post-production. A virtual production team can help set this up, this, all this infrastructure and approval system during the development phase of the project. So ICVR's uh, virtual art department, their bad team, created the moving scenery that would play behind the truck. And these images show the final look of the content. It's important to note that the content does not look photo real to the eye, it looks CG. With our short timeline, we knew from the beginning of the project that we would have about three to five weeks total working with our VAD teams. We set a goal in each sequence to test the level of photo reel a production might need to budget for in each of these three scenarios. So for example, would the content need to sell as photo reel to our eye, on the wall, or through the camera's lens? In this case, we were able to sell a low fidelity visualization quality image to the camera and cheat that it was real. In LED wall virtual production workflows, it's important to have a clear understanding of the desired content quality level for playback during the final shoot as early as possible. These decisions will impact how to budget time and resources on the project, as well as how early to pull a post visual effects vendor on as well. And making evaluations like this early in the development stages and pre-production can help save resources for other shots that might require 100% more detail. So ICVR used motion capture techniques during our previous phase to identify accurate timing for each scene to ensure we had enough content for playback on set. They also recorded motion for characters inside the truck to help our directors visualize active performance during each scene and those timings as well. Photogrammetry is an essential virtual production tool for our production designer, VAD and VFX teams to match the virtual and physical worlds. Uh, by scanning our stages, as Eric's presentation showed, and by scanning our truck early in the process, we were able to use scale accurate versions of these assets during all phases of our project. And the truck even made its way into one of the final shots of the film in our battlefield sequence. Our key department heads were able to use SketchFab AR on a tablet or iPhone to place that virtual truck on our stage during testing in inverse visualization. Um, that helped our directors uh, both on stage and in their homes remotely uh, plan shots with that truck so they could actually put that up in their living room, which was kind of cool. Um, this video clip is an example of a previous session held between ICVR, our directors, and DP to work out which shots were physically possible to capture on set as well as which lenses they plan to use. Uh, you can just hit record there on the okay. bottom of the iPad. Okay, and it, will it start the animation? Yep, it should start the animation. I do have a um, just a full frontal two shot. That's oh, yeah. Really cool. Yeah. Cool. I'm just spitballing, but I was thinking like at the top of scene five, 
we, we could have some cool shots like this. Like I like how the truck is like halfway through the frame so that we're getting just, yeah, we're getting part of like the character and the landscape so we can kind of take it in, take yeah. the fact that we're getting closer to the battlefield in before they make the decision to stop there. So these images show how this became a final shot captured in camera. If you watch the clip closely, you can see us building the shot together. We call action for talent, start to physically rock the truck, and then the content begins to play. So before rolling takes, the virtual production supervisor and director analyze the horizon line, the alignment of the virtual and physical stage, as well as verify real world scale. These images are another example kind of showing how content that may not necessarily be photo real to one's eye on set can appear real through the camera's lens. This is also an example of a shot um, that's sort of interesting and I'll make sure it's playing while I speak. Um, it's an example of a shot that might be expensive to execute using a green screen workflow. The camera's movement forward on the Z axis, in addition to the prop and character movement in front of the screen, could be challenging to roto. And not to mention, if a green screen were used, there may have been green light spill inside the truck and or on the characters as well that would need additional post cleanup, uh, which leads us to our key findings. Applying double depth of field can create both challenges and benefits depending on the context it's being applied in. And a good visual for this were the three images of the people in the car that you just saw. This term describes any additional blur or defocusing of the virtual background in addition to the actual depth of field determined by the physical lens. When your virtual scene is played back on an LED wall, the entire depth of the image is flattened on a single plane of the wall, including any virtual elements in the foreground that extend beyond the wall into your practical set. This can cause noticeable inconsistencies between how the virtual camera applies depth of field to your virtual scene, even if it seems to match the physical camera settings um, in the software. We can dive into this a little bit more later. Um, but the next point would be with proper distance from LED walls, it's definitely possible to avoid moray. And content does not need to be a uh, photo reel necessarily to the eye. It really needs to sell as photo reel um, through the lens. Um, so I prepared a few clips from the truck sequence just so you can see how they're cut together in the final film. I always thought of ourselves as lucky. Not everyone who works for the union gets taken care of the way we do. There ain't no beauty left out here. Just scrap battle and propaganda. Well, I still think we have the better end of the deal, don't you think? I mean, somebody's got to collect. Yeah, well, if it's between dying and collecting, I suppose you're right. So up next is our dining room scene. In many ways, adding an LED translight behind a window is a very straightforward process. However, there are a few considerations that need to be made in advance to reduce complexity. For example, do we see the floor? How do we design the content to show parallax in a believable way? How do we hide the seams of the corners of the screen created by the curved LED panels? How do we avoid moray when the plexiglass window magnifies the LED wall of various perspectives? So to briefly describe our pre-production phase, we took reference images and designs provided by our directors to concept and build the virtual world that existed outside the window. This image shows a matte painting our virtual production supervisor created as a placement and lighting guide for uh, the VAD team. And similar to the truck, we held remote previous sessions with ICVR and our DP to find shots using a Dragonfly virtual camera iPad system provided by Glassbox Technologies. Building a shot list in our virtual environment helped our virtual production team understand which camera angles the director planned to use most on set. And this was also helpful for the AD who had to factor in specific shot timings for our shoot day. 
The tech biz and onstage testing process helped our team identify how to marry the virtual and physical worlds. And we decided in that process that the speaker polls would become light sources during evening scenes to give the DP the ability to pull the virtual lighting onto the practical set, creating a further sense of realism. So during our stage testing phase, our team had the flexibility to manipulate virtual assets and refine the composition of the environment in relation to the physical set piece. Our virtual art department teams and stage operators required computers outfitted with exceptional GPUs for building the environments, optimizing them, and making sure they play back properly on set. All of these areas required speed and memory caching. And you sort of realize uh, when you're working with certain workflows in display, workflows being one of them, that adding that plugin can cut your GPUs in half immediately. And just that's kind of where we are at this point. But once physical testing on stage begins, there are usually more challenges that arise as all the pieces start coming together. For example, we learned that darker, high contrast content can make scan lines and banding visible to the camera. The plexiglass magnified and distorted the LED walls at certain angles, causing array. And we were not able to eliminate either issue uh, completely and choreograph the steady cam to avoid them, ultimately, which leads us to our key findings for this scene. Testing motion materials in front of LED walls is critical during early days. Scan lines and banding are a challenge to look out for. They're visible in darker, high contrast imagery. And gen locking your system is a step to help remove some of these issues. Planning regular onstage testing is critical for syncing both creative and technical goals on a project. And so here's a few clips from this scene as well, actually. The government treats people like they're disposable. I'm not gonna sit here where people get enough to die for a meaningless war. Meaningless? You tell that to the people who lost their homes, their families, their, their livelihoods to those things. She's not there. Okay, just, just let me know if you hear anything, please. The last time we were all together, she had been so angry. And now I understand why. So up next, our battlefield environment took us to a completely new stage, created by a totally different set of vendors. One of the main challenges in the battlefield was matching our practical and virtual sets. We had planned on shooting wider shots in the world, which would require more detail overall. So Halon and Lux Machina were partnered vendors for this environment. Halon provided pre-biz, tech biz, VAD, and 100% remote consultation on set. Well, let's provide our LED volume, its operation, and onset content playback. Starting with reference images, our directors began designing the world with Halon's bad team. Our production designer worked with both the visual, the virtual, and physical art departments to execute the vision. Having access to scan data of Lux's stage, we were able to design shots visualizing what it would be like to shoot them in the volume. This was a very important process for our DP. To the left, you can see our DP's plan to shoot the appropriate coverage for the scene. To the right is an image depicting a new way the DP had to learn to design shots. We had to take into account that the camera might stay in the same position or same area, and the virtual world would rotate behind the talent. It's important to talk about prep on stage and how we got from the onset testing process to the final shoot. Each of these images represent a step in our process that builds on each other to create an in-camera visual effects shot. It was important to spend our testing days sharing successes and challenges with our AD at various stages in the process so that they could help anticipate how to use time most efficiently on set. So all these steps occur between tech biz and the final shoot per shot. As you can see, the Lux stage was much smaller than the XR stage and its shape dictated how we created content and a shooting plan. When selecting a stage and a wall system with your team, it's important to consider the size and dimensions you will need early on to avoid creative limitations. It's also important to consider pixel pitch as it determines how close your physical camera can shoot the wall. This is an example of the final pixel imagery we we're able to capture in camera on set. And I like this example because it has a strong mid-ground, foreground, and background. 
As I mentioned earlier, our photogrammetry truck asset made it into one of the final battlefield shots. And already, which is great. The challenges we faced were selling a low resolution scan as a final animated asset, as well as optimizing the content to play back at the proper frame rate with an animated asset moving the shot. This is also an example for how GPU technology played a critical role in our success. Working with the Lux team, we were able to benefit from their advanced knowledge in device profiling, system calibration, color management, and camera tracking. They were able to provide advanced optimization support and offered an entirely Genlock system, which gave, gave us more uh, creative flexibility with camera movement and on-screen animation. I'll play it one more time, just quickly, because it's cool to see the shadow go across. That's one of my favorite parts. I think we really sold it. Um, but I'll move forward onto our key findings. So loading content on LED walls and QCing takes time. LED walls are run by computers that can overheat, reboot, and create power, power outages while you're working. Um, it's important to set aside extra time on stage for adjustments when matching a physical and virtual set. Any assets in the virtual world that exist beyond the LED wall in the foreground in world space um, of the practical set will have scale issues, tracking issues, and depth of field issues. And sometimes when you are identifying that, it can look like another issue. So um, you can also talk about that in QA later if you'd like. Um, I prepared some clips from our battlefield sequence now um, from the final film. Most people who work for the union are either fighting battles or cleaning up after it scouring battlefields for remnants of weaponry and sometimes even chips that can be recycled for the next group of soldiers <laughs> Ara used to say that the chips implanted in soldiers actually turn them into mindless robots programmed to do nothing but fight until death I had never seen Dad get so angry. No enemy too strong. Sign up for our training program today. The daily union announcements that blare out from the speakers tell us to make sacrifices, gather our strengths, and fight. So virtual production workflows are impacting the evolution of the entertainment industry and can be applied in various combinations to both live action and full animation pipelines, these real-time game engines being that common denominator. Workflows and techniques that were only available to a select few for the past two decades are now available to a wider range of professionals and consumers. It's important to note that Ripple Effect applied very specific virtual production techniques to achieve specific creative goal, to capture final pixel and camera visual effects using LED walls. It's a significant case study that models best practices for studios and independent filmmakers as they approach integrating these techniques and workflows into future projects. If planned properly, virtual production practices can be accessible and affordable. Understanding how to reallocate project resources, build the right team, and plan ahead for a project's desired results are the key to unlocking these workflows. Creative should be the driving force to further innovation in these areas. However, for the virtual production ecosystem to continue thriving, our industry should simultaneously focus on standardization, best practices, infrastructure, and training crew. To continue these conversations, the ETC team has organized a virtual production test group dedicated to exploring these points and will continue releasing documentation of our findings further into this year as well. So thank you so much. That's, that's my presentation for both of Thank you so much, Catherine. I really appreciate it. A few questions have come in. Uh, somebody wanted to know if there's room for improvisation on the set or if we're locked down to repeat the performances from the previous. Yeah, I mean, I would say 
It's going to depend on the project and how you set yourself up. So if you know going into certain shots, um, you know, we have to technically execute it this way for safety reasons, you might be locked into specific choreography um, for the camera or for your talent. But if you go into that production saying, we just need to lock these certain aspects of it because we want to have more time to improvise on set, that's completely achievable. Okay. Somebody else wanted to know what the target frame rate was when optimizing the scenes for the stage. Um, well, we usually doubled it. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we would, we would let them know we want the scene to run at 48 to 60 frames per second. And we were just lucky if we got to 24 or 30 frames in some cases. Um, and that's where the stage testing is key because you know, you can optimize things look great in real time scene, but until you run it through end display or your disguise system or whatever, uh, you know, system that you're working with, uh, you won't really understand how that point in your workflow is affecting that real time scene. And you might have to do further optimization on stage with that, either your stage crew or your content um, team there as well. Excellent. Somebody else, Greg Chachio answered this question, but I'd love your take on it too, where somebody asked that, you know, out of expediency, companies may revert to their previous catalog of effects, use them from production to production. So how can you ensure that they present new and fresh previs and pre-production on a title by title basis? Oh, sure. Do you just mean like, like repurposing assets? Or... Yeah, that's what it sounds like. Yeah. Um... Well, I mean, I think that's a conversation that you could have with the visualization company or the team that you're working with. Um, it actually might save your production a ton of time and money to use those assets. Um, so I don't, I don't see what the problem would be necessarily, unless they're proprietary. Well, it's a little bit like visual effects. I mean, companies certainly reuse and build on existing assets, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah all the time. Somebody else asked a question that Eric answered in the in the queue, and I'd love you to answer it too, which is, were there any unant unanticipated or surprising wins or discoveries that you didn't see coming? Ooh, wins. Um, or yeah. discoveries. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, definitely. Um, oh boy, now I'm on the clock. Let me throw one out there while you're, you're pondering that. Um, if you turn all the LEDs on to white, you might blow the power. <laughs> that was an unintended discovery. <laughs> may not be a win. May not be a win, but- uh... Why don't you ponder that, Catherine? We'll move on to Greg. And that's a good question that we can you know, revisit if, if you want to. So uh, thank you so much, Catherine. Great, uh, great presentation. And Greg, take it away. Talk, talk, you're gonna talk about post-production now, correct? Uh, I'm going to talk about the, the technical side here of, of uh, remote production and some virtual production. Yeah, the post uh, we'll touch on uh, as far as it uh, pertains to what I just mentioned. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you. Uh, I'm Greg Chaccio, um, a um, uh, SEMPTE board member, also chair of the ASC Technology uh, Committee or, or Council's uh, Workflow Committee. Um, and I was the executive producer uh, with, along with Catherine and Eric on Ripple Effect, and I handled the production uh, technology and the post side. So I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully you all can see this. All good? Sharing the right screen? Yes, I can see it. Great, thank you. All right, so um, I don't have a whole lot of slides here. I'm gonna bring up a, a, a more of a, a workflow sheet, but basically, um, you know, we had a, a need for remote workflows. We've been heading down this direction for a long time, slowly and incrementally, but obviously uh, like a lot of things happen by necessity. We've gone through strikes and tsunamis and all kinds of things that have accelerated uh, change. COVID did the same thing for remote production. So um, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on our uh, Miro board, which is kind of my digital playground. But here is a, a shot of, of our stage, the uh, XR stage. We had two main stages, XR and Lux Machina, and each had their own uh, sets of challenges. Um, in the case of uh, the XR stage here, 
we had a great big volume, which was nice, but we had very little connectivity. And, and we'll talk about that uh, and how that affected our, our host side. Um, in safety viz, we already went through that uh, very well. Uh, great, great work by the safety viz team. Um, and then we had uh, some challenges that I'll talk about as far as uh, little things that happened, like our director not being available to be uh, on site for one of the key days. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch over real quickly to the Miro board now. So those of you not sure if everyone's familiar with Miro, but it's kind of our uh, our our work board collaboration tool, and uh, it's a fantastic tool. We have uh, this is the thirty thousand foot view. This is what I call the single line for those uh, uh, are technical out there. Basically, it's all the Kazinas and the Kazoutas, everything in, that's necessary in providing a, a complete workflow. Uh, from end to end. The virtual production has a lot of things. And as Catherine touched on, we do have a virtual production group that is really set uh, um, you know, in motion to solve a lot of the problems and provide best practices for, uh, for an area really, which is still very, very new. Um, so going to our, our main onset here, and, and by the way, in creating this, this helped inform um, a lot of different things. For instance, if you see here, I've labeled some of these on stage, off stage, and off lot. So in 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 creating the workflow, um, and also with a, with an eye on on the headcount, we can kind of change it depending on uh, what the needs were. So uh, again, two stages: XR and Lux Machina. We started out at XR, uh, and we ended up at Lux. This is actually uh, the Lux Machina stage right here. It's a bit smaller. And with that, we had a, a cap on headcount that we found out. Um, we, we probably should have uh, realized this would happen because it's not as large a stage, but we somehow had to take our crew of 30 and get it down to a crew of about 10 to 12 people uh, right on the stage here. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, so coming back out again, for the remote side, we had uh, some really cool systems uh, that were uh, supplied by Teradek and uh, by fifth kind. So uh, for the uh, remote viewing system, so this is the through the lens. We had an Airy Alexa LF. Uh, we were shooting in open gate, so we had the full uh, four and a half K. Uh, we were all in HDR, which I'll go over as well on the imaging side, but we're able to basically capture in very high quality uh, the through the lens portion of the Alexa LF along with all the metadata, which is super important here. Uh, and here's another scene as well, the dining room scene. And then we also had a, uh, a crew cam or witness cam as it's sometimes called. And the nice thing about this is it gives remote viewers, especially for our director who is directing off the East Coast, some context as to where everybody is on stage. So uh, she can uh, understand who's on and what we're doing just by kind of looking around here on that side. Um, we've since uh, added with our testing group scopes. So if somebody wants to actually uh, look at what's happening on the, you know, through the camera, through the lens, that's great. But they can also look at the waveform vector scope, the RGB parade, anything that, that they want to look at and make sure um, everything is looking great. And that's helped us uh, quite a bit uh, in some of our testing where we might have been clipping in a certain color channel and someone was able to, uh, to call that out and let us know on set. Um, so we have basically, uh, uh, one of our challenges is on XR stages, we had 35 megabits of bandwidth. Now, um, we have a lot more than that at our homes. Now, of course, the stage has a lot more bandwidth now, but that was a few months, that was you know eight months ago now, and things changed quickly. Um, the stage was basically prepared, we were one of the first people on it, so it was kind of a um, uh, you know very early days for them. And, uh, and yes, it's a great volume and a lot of space, a uh, lot of uh, square footage of walls, but not great connectivity. So what we did is we enlisted the team at Teradek and uh, we used a bond backpack system. And what this is, is a bonded cellular system uh, that takes a variety of different connections. We had a hard line, sorry about the helicopter overhead. Uh, we had uh, uh, Wi-Fi and we also had up to four bonded cells to make sure that we were uh, operating all the time. And I have to say it worked flawlessly. Even when we went down on stage, we still had signal. 
And then over here, uh, we had our DIT station. Uh, the great Dane Bren was our DIT and production technologist working along with me. Um, and we had to make sure that not only were all of the images uh, looking good on, set, on stage, uh, but they looked good off stage because we're in an era now, as we all know, uh, where somebody can be looking at the images as you're shooting them before you even have a chance to review them. We wanna make sure that, that everything is looking correct uh, and that uh, um, all the imaging standards are being adhered to. Um, we basically use ACES and uh, uh, I, I know Jay-Z would be proud. Oops, what's going on here? Ah, we don't wanna do that right now. So we've got, uh, we were basically UHD monitoring on stage. We had a uh, Sony BVX X300 uh, display. Thank you, Sony. Uh, and we uh, also had a uh, LG OLED. Uh, and the idea here is that we had uh, certain people like the DP, uh, Catherine, myself, uh, virtual production supervisor. We're looking at the hero monitor here, right? There's only one. Uh, God monitor, and then for all of the keys, they're looking at a 65-inch uh, display, which we had uh, right uh, off stage. I have some pictures of that as well. Uh, and another th nice thing about this is we were using uh, a, a Teradex system that let us basically send the signal anywhere in the world uh, as long as you had an Apple TV. It, it'll work off other devices as well, but this is really great because at the last second, all we had to do is just grab our Apple TVs from home show up on stage the next day. And now I have a couple more of these that I could put in the lobby of the uh, facility so that you can basically monitor and see what's going on uh, off stage instead of having to be on stage, which really helped us out quite a bit over at Lux Machina. Um, the nice thing about ACES, of course, is it's an image interchange framework that allow us to, uh, to work in a very wide space uh, and then later on decide what we're going to need. Uh, in the case of Ripple Effect, of course, there's the festival circuit, there's, uh, there's home viewing, there's all kinds of things um, that we're not aware of yet, so, um, or that we're not uh, uh, decided on. So basically, we're able to output whatever we need. In this case, uh, we output a nice HDR 1000 and an SDR. And then at some point when people are actually going back into theaters, which I guess is happening now, uh, we'll have the, uh, the HDR master uh, trim created for, uh, for cinema. Uh, and for editorial, we were basically working in HD, good old HD space in Rec. 709 uh, using an AVID uh, codec. All right, so, so there are two main ways that our off-lot viewers would see the signals. One was right through Teradek Core, and the other was through Fifth Kind. Fifth Kind had a relatively new product. I think we were the first ones to use it, or one of the first, called Core Live. And the really cool thing about Core Live is fifth kind was our asset management system that we use for everything. So storyboards, script, everything, all of our assets were in fifth kind. And the nice thing about the fifth kind core live system is we send basically a restream from Teradek core directly to fifth kind. And anybody that already had a fifth kind account, which was everybody, and we basically had a system by which everything was set up in advance. Um, and and, and if, you, if you had a login, all you had to do is hit a big blue button that said view live stream if we were actually going live. So uh, we, we had Slack as our information network. And so uh, we would, we would uh, send out a little message saying, all right, everybody, uh, day two, uh, we're going live. Please log in to Fifth Kind and you can watch the stream. Uh, it didn't require anything other than what you already had. Um, for lower latency, uh, for, for very few, like our director here, who is directing uh, from the East Coast, we used the Teradek core directly. It took a little bit more uh, setup, not much at all, uh, but, uh, but I just had to add her as a user. And now she can view right off the Teradek system, not linked again to any of the asset management capabilities of fifth kind, but uh, purpose built to see what was going on on stage. Now, um, in addition to the live stream, of course, we had to have dailies done. Now with 35 megabits, not a lot of bandwidth. So I worked with the fine folks at Technicolor and we actually had the daily system on set and, or I should say near set uh, because it is not absolutely quiet. And so what we would do is we would have our data manager copy the footage uh, off to uh, the cart and we use the, uh, the ASC MHL, which is a new ASC innovation 
uh, for our, um, uh, our uh, hash list, basically, our MIDI hash list. And um, that basically uh, is, it was integrated into Silverstack. Uh, we have a group over at AFC called Advanced Data Management. And uh, Patrick Renner is the chair of that working group. So we were able to make that happen. Uh, that made sure that we had uh, file integrity and a manifest. Uh, we Greg, had the, I think you point out yeah. that it wasn't even 35 consistent megs. It seemed to go down or have challenges because it simply wasn't network properly. So yeah, that would yeah. even that would even be like a stretch on the good side. So it was it, on on a good day when the wind was blowing in the right direction. Absolutely. So so that's why it was really great to have those bond backpacks. Thank you, Teradek and uh, and John for making that happen. Um, we also had LTO eight just because we're still in a world with tape. Um, and but the data went to a uh, Seagate's live drive again, another another solution that was pretty darn new, and we helped test that out. And that uh, that live drive mobile array uh, had all the the data, the uh, the digital camera negative, the Avid daily zooming, etc. And that basically uh, was in this great little form factor uh, that would slide right out. We had a, a receiving chassis on the cart that would slide right out and go over to Equinix. Uh, and Equinix basically uh, would, would have that dock. We, off we would go. We had some great orchestration that got it into our, our Avid in the cloud. Um, we used a variety of different systems. Uh, F-Track, uh, those of you who are familiar with Shotgun, it's very similar. Uh, we had Fifth Kind, Bluescape for a lot of our visualization. Uh, so a lot of players. Uh, it's great to have a lot of players because you get to see their strengths and weaknesses. You know, no one product does everything. So you end up kind of relying on the strengths of each product. And then the great, the great news is we had some really great integration meetings where uh, Fifth Kind and F-Track spoke together and we got integrations and, and hooks and tie-ins into Bluescape with Fifth Kind as well. So that helped quite a bit. And Greg, on that uh, point, I think that yeah. that's really important to note is we did a lot of integrations amongst these software tools, simple things like C4 or SEMPTE 21, 14-2017, so that we'd have a consistent identifier uh, for the data. Great point, great point. And the ASC MHL actually is is uh, is, is uh, agnostic. So C4 is something that definitely is integrated into the ASC MHL. Uh, look look uh, for more about the MHL and some upcoming SIMPTE editions uh, that we're writing soon. So on the post side, basically, uh, everything went into Azure. Uh, and Technicolor has chosen Azure as well as did Avid. So that kind of uh, um, dictated where we were going there. We had on the visual effects side, uh, Fuse FX, Pixamondo, uh, Brooke Noska, who I know is listening, uh, was our visual effects uh, supervisor uh, and producer and uh, made sure this all worked smoothly. Uh, and then uh, Technicolor uses Pixpan, which is a great uh, lossless uh, data accelerator and then Technicolor did all of the finishing. We did an Atmos mix and we did a full HDR uh, picture finishing. Uh, and then that basically uh, went to Alluvio and Alluvio was our, our, at this point, it's our, it's a, it's a closed uh, viewing system. It will be opened up at some point as Eric mentioned, but right now we are shopping the film festival circuit and they have their own rules. Um, uh, we had some like Eric and Catherine viewed uh, text stream, basically. They reviewed color and, uh, and other titles, et cetera, through text stream. So that was really nice. And let's see, let me check my time, make sure we're not going too, too crazy. I'll just briefly go over the, the cart. So uh, again, thanks to Brandon and the, and the folks at Colorfront, we were able to monitor off the industry standard X300 um, and uh, using the, uh, the Aja FSHDR, uh, also with Colorfront Engine, in there as well as the image analyzer. And that uh, helped us really uh, make sure that all of the virtual production imagery that we shot played well in HDR and SDR. Um, this is a new world, of course. We've got panels now that are operating in SDR as we're doing a lot of our virtual production testing, we're realizing that some of them are HDR capable, but it's not simply you know, flipping a switch. So we just wanted to make sure that that with, with creating, with doing all the virtual art department, the VAD and all of that, that everything read properly in both HDR and SDR. And so the FS HDR allows us to switch seamlessly between uh, an SDR image and an HDR image to ensure that we're good there. And then on our cloud side, I won't spend a lot of time on the cloud side, but we had some great partners again from Alt, 
Equinix, the, 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 the folks at uh, Pixit, Storage DNA. Um, and, and so, so part, of, part of what we do at the ETC is not just develop the million dollar solutions, right? So we've got a lot of different solution, uh, a lot of different clients and, and, and a lot of different uh, levels of uh, expectations out there. So we wanted to make sure that we can engineer a system that would work for those who have tons of budget and, uh, and, and unlimited resources, but also um, those out there, independents and ones that, that, you know, a lot of people say, yeah, the future is the cloud, but it's expensive. So we experimented with having some local cloud, basically some private cloud. Uh, it, ultimately, we ended up just using um, the, the Avid uh, in the cloud directly. We had a single editor system. So in this case, um, you know, it was fine to have the editor work right on the uh, Avid in the cloud uh, using this version of Media Composer. Our editor uh, worked from home, but also from work. So he actually uh, was over at USC. And the nice thing about this is you can use a very, very light, thin client. And if he had time in between uh, classes or in between things, he could just fire up the, the session and he can edit it away, simply close the laptop, go home, bring it up again, and he's off and running again with no worries. So that's uh, certainly, I think that's a huge advent is editing in the cloud. There's some more connectivity detail. And um, as was mentioned, there is a white paper. So we'll go through um, a lot of this in the white paper. We also have a website, www.rippleeffectfilm.com. So you can take a look at uh, some more information on the website. Uh, being conscious of time, I know it's 7.08. I'm just gonna go back to my PowerPoint real quickly. I should say PowerPoint. We have a bit of time, Greg, so it's good. Great, great. Okay, great. So here's an example again of the through the lens uh, and the witness cam over at XR. Um, we had, uh, so, so you know, the, I was mentioning that we could not have a lot of people on stage. So as we were loading in and prepping and, and art was setting up and, and set design, we uh, were able to have our directors uh, and our AD basically um, come in uh, virtually. So you can tell I'm the one who's on stage because I'm wearing the mask, uh, but they're all basically reviewing what's happening and they can kind of help direct us uh, remotely. We've got uh, the fantastic and fabulous Brooke Noska on the upper right here. Uh, she's actually reviewing some of the visual effect shots right there on stage. So she doesn't have to get uh, right up on, uh, on stage there where we have uh, our COVID requirement there. And on the bottom right, you can see we're doing an avid review session virtually as well which worked very nicely. Yeah, again, another shot of uh, Lux Machina, and you can kind of see where we had the DIT card, the uh, X300 to the right of it. Um, we've got our directors. So we couldn't even have our directors be uh, right on stage until we're ready to roll. And we would do a little bit of do -si do dancing uh, where some people would leave. For instance, I would be on stage and then I would leave and Dane to come in. Um, so we, that was all part of the, the COVID plan. We have our directors, Hannah and Margo, in the upper right. You can see they're in Lux Mock in his kitchen, uh, uh, basically uh, viewing uh, remotely on uh, one of our uh, one of our uh, flat screen displays that uh, we're using out there to help them. We have um, costume, makeup, and hair out in the breezeway that helped cut down traffic as well. And then uh, we also have uh, Scripty uh, down on the lower right, uh, all the script notes that she has. Uh, are being uh, fed into uh, fifth kind, which is fantastic. Uh, another shot to show the, uh, the clarity of the image. I don't know if it reads over there on Zoom. Uh, we've got our data management. This is our daily system um, over in the nice, cool, and quiet location in the XR kitchen. So that's what the, that's what we use there uh, for the Technicolor system. Chris's cart is on the left. The Technicolor system is in the middle. And then the Seagate Live Drive rack is on the right. Uh, and then just a little shot of, uh, of Equinix there and the companion receiving chassis uh, on the lower right there. Uh, we kind of went through that, the little, little uh, remote uh, uh, editing using Clearview Flex. So SohoNet is in the mix here as well. That worked very well, uh, not only for the editorial, but um, to, I guess it was Howard's question too earlier, is how much can you change on the fly? We had Halon uh, basically, which was working on the scenes uh, that Lux Machina uh, 
uh, or that we were shooting at Lux Machina, and we were able to have them um, review remotely. So if anything needed to be changed, uh, Catherine and her team would sync up. So uh, yeah, the beauty of obviously real time uh, game engines is that you can move things around uh, on on the day up to to handle anything that that needs to change, and that worked really well. Uh, went through the color data management. I'm not going to go through this too much, but uh, um, I think we really have to monitor HDR. We're now getting to the point where the uh, LED walls themselves are performing in HDR. The brightness is important, but of course, what's more important for a lot of us is the shadow detail. And so um, some of these panels uh, and these systems uh, don't quite roll nicely from code value zero. So uh, you know there, there, there's some processing that Brompton has and others that help do some dithering to, uh, to try to get it where it does have a smooth uh, bottom end and that's going to improve. So I think we're gonna really look forward to having uh, HDR in all of our images. Uh, so what's needed? Communications. Uh, to anyone's question who might ask what was the challenge that you didn't quite um, uh, solve or fix, I definitely would make sure that we have, uh, have much more robust comm systems. Uh, we had basic walkie-talkies, which a lot of sets still have. Uh, it's one of those weird things in our business where if you've been in live TV or even theater for, for many years, they have these kind of systems, but on film sets, often they're not used. They are, they are definitely improving. And, and, and some people are using them, some uh, productions. But especially when you've got masks on, you've got PPE, full PPE, you've got, you've got uh, the face shields, you, you want to even get closer to somebody because you can't hear what they're saying. So what we found is, is these systems work fantastic. I got to say, um, Unity saved uh, my butt, basically. Uh, we've been using them quite a bit. It's a software solution that works right with your cell phone. So um, some of these other systems out there, like Faircom, uh, Riedel, RTS, those are pretty high-end systems, and they're great. Uh, but the Unity system, if you need anyone to be um, communicating on set and also offline anywhere in the world, this system's great. Uh, we've been using it quite a bit lately. Uh, it, it, it actually, I, I was surprised when I, uh, my Apple Watch lit up. Somebody was calling me, and I didn't even know it had Apple Watch integration. And it was pretty flawless. So. Uh, you know, I, I think that the, these systems are absolutely imperative for all film shoots going forward. The other thing, a um, couple other things that we that we were that were on our, our our list of things to test out. Eric uh, can probably comment a little more if needed. But 5G, uh, as we know, not quite there. Still not quite there yet. Even if your phone light comes on and says you're in 5G, we're not there. Uh, Wi-Fi six. Uh, to be honest, I didn't think that we really needed it, but when we started integrating SetBuddy, uh, which was not something that I foresaw uh, you know, early on, I realized Wi-Fi 6 would have really helped us or could have really helped us on stage because there's a lot of RF on set. And uh, yeah. you know, things, things might work really well all up until the day of shoot, and then you get little false positives or negatives on SetBuddy. Yeah, or a repeater of some sort for the set buddy as well, which they do offer. We had a challenge with the 5G because there just wasn't a, a proper tower in Pacoima that we could roll out a trash can sized device to uh, that would get us a clear 5G signal. We will be looking yep. at that at the next project. Yeah, um, that's about it on the uh, on that. I've just got a few pictures to show, and then we'll, okay. we'll call it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not going to call it, call it. I'm going to uh, say a few things when there's no, a couple of course, questions. Of course. Okay. Yeah. So um, this is something actually we didn't show, Catherine. I'm just going to just quickly show some of this. Uh, the audio is not important if you can't hear, but this was uh, an invaluable tool in previous to basically uh, show what the truck, our, our hero truck was going to look like before we actually rented it. You know, we, we're not a multi-million dollar budget. So we had to, you know, be really prudent with our, our expenditure. And so we could actually visualize what the truck would look like on stage by using this amazing tool called Sketchfab. Mm -hmm. That's wrong. What's cool bundles. is you can look right through the back of the truck in that and see what the windows would see out the holes. It was really cool. Exactly. There's Dane, our fabulous uh, DIT. 
And uh, there's Brooke again. You've seen some of these pictures. I just realized there's <clears> the other thing. There we go. So here's some of our scopes. You can see we're monitoring in HDR. Uh, some of the colors are on the hairy edge there. Um, <clears> and that's it. This is actually the same stage, XR stage, with a different configuration. So you can see how flexible these setups are. Uh, that, that other setup does not exist anymore. It looks more like that. Uh, and I think that's about it. I'm going to stop my screen if anyone has any questions. Well, why don't we all come panelists? Why don't you um, come on stage again? Uh, Catherine, there's a question for you that's open, which is somebody wants to know how you manage expectations for photorealism. And, you know, in pre, did you know how your render looked so that there would be some threshold that it had to hit to look real in camera? Well, the first thing I said when I got the schedule, you know, when we were putting the schedule together was, well, we are probably not going to have photo reel, like final visual effects photo reel. So we're all going to have to be very clear with each other what uh, level we would like to achieve. And so um, with having, I mean, I would say it's just kind of open communication and being that direct with everybody, really. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and kind of knowing when I was talking to the visualization vendors um, who were our main bad teams doing the final in-camera visual effects, it was the goal is to make this as photo real as possible. I understand that we're going to be leaning on pre-made assets for a majority of this. Um, so we want to take this time get as many pre assets loaded in as possible so the directors can iterate their vision and then try to give those vendors the most time possible with onset onset stage testing with us so that we could see as soon as possible what the quality level would be and then figure out with our shot design how to make that work and how to how to work around that and on this schedule it was very tight i mean um, for a bigger project, you know, something that has a, like a full budget, you know, you'd want to put like 30 weeks or 40 weeks in, in front of the um, production day. But we had three to five weeks and then we had a couple weeks to shoot it. So, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes when you hear time, you can actually just say, you know, do you want it fast, high quality? or cheap, you know, and you kind of- Oh yeah, <laughs> that old yeah. sex joke, right? Yeah, so when I heard the, the time, I was like, well, everyone, <laughs> we're gonna have to set a standard for what photo reel is on this. So that's kind of how we did it. Well, speaking of standards, this is a Simpty Hollywood event. So do, I'm curious from all three of you and you don't all have to answer, but when, you know, is our standards for virtual production, remote production, Safety standards, are they going to come to SIMPTI for standardization at some point? So I think that it, as you start to look at that, I think we're still in a wild, wild west where a lot of this is an art form. Um, making all these things work really well together isn't quite the science that we'd love it to be yet. And so at ETC, we are actually focused on that. We do have working groups that are doing things like understanding the panels better, looking at the color science, um, creating kind of these documentations beyond what we've already published saying, here's something that you need to know if you're gonna come on set. So, so we are running um, a working group that both Greg and Catherine and Horst from Universal are working very hard on to uh, propagate knowledge on this topic. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, did you have something you wanted to add, Greg? Yeah, yeah. One of the things that we realize, though, is the standardization process it takes a certain amount of time. This technology is changing so quickly. So I think in producing best practices, we ended up with these with de facto standardizations of things that just happen because they make sense to happen. And so that's a lot of what we're going through right now is, is, is uh, we've got teams from Weta to ILM to all over the place, and we're looking at how they're approaching these. And it's kind of like different countries all starting up back in the old days. Everyone had their way of doing it. And as we all talk together, we're like, oh, wow, that's interesting. I never thought I should do that. And, and through these kind of meetings and the, the, these, these shoots that we're doing, um, a lot of these, these practices come to light. And we are documenting them and they will be 
uh, made public through white papers. Great. One last question before I hand it over to Brian Gaffney to end, which is we've had a few people ask, where can I see this? Um, <laughs> so who would like to explain why they can't see it right now? <laughs> um, the reason is that basically for them to submit to festivals, they cannot release this publicly for everyone to see. And so we wrestle with this problem every single year. Um, and it has gone out to certain small select or private audience, but I, I, we can't just release it, it publicly. Um, I do believe there is a platform that we might be putting it up with that will make it available publicly in, in a certain amount of time. Um, and what's also cool is we are working on um, prepping for next year. So we're already building up the teams and the um, folks and the ideas um, to work on the next project. Well, to stay, in, to stay on top of that and find out when and where you can see it, I urge you to um, sign up for the free um, ETC newsletter, ET Centric, and you will read it there first, no doubt. Right, Eric? Yes. Okay. So thank you all so much. It was really great presentations from you all. I hope um, we had a really good group stay for the whole thing. So thanks for coming. And I wanna hand it over to Brian Gaffney, uh, President Emeritus of SMT Hollywood to end this event. Take it thank away, you, Deborah. Brian. Thank you so much, Deborah. And thanks again to Eric, Catherine and Greg. It was so well presented and thanks for taking the time to take us again through the ripple effect. Um, last thing I wanted to close out with is uh, April 26th, Monday, April 26th will be the end of our election period. And we have a very broad and diverse uh, uh, group of section managers and chair people uh, all the way down uh, from governor on the West Coast here to vote for. So definitely go to simpty.org uh, section dash elections and get out the vote. So with that, I want to thank everyone tonight for joining us, and we are going to wrap up at that point. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you for attending. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.